you don't really need all platforms to win. You just need to do one really well. The biggest thing right now, if you want to be discovered, is short form video content and being able on any platform to have your music algorithmically served up as much mm -hmm. as possible. TikTok is actually a really great tool where you can get a really deep understanding of what fans care about on an artist just by searching hashtags. It's a mixed bag depending on the artist, right? I'm seeing artists breakthrough moment simply by them being the ones that are putting content out themselves, right? I do think there is a real need for people to understand how new fans consume music. There's ways that you can take that content that fans are creating and help tell a narrative off platform, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, here's all the, all these people posting about this record, you should highlight this song. Or beyond that, you can tell a story with publicity, looking at how fans are reacting and telling the story about, oh, your fans clearly have a, a very deep connection with the lyrics. Because a lot of the stuff that gets posted on TikTok are people highlighting lyrics and mm. making things about that. It's all different platforms in, in the way that I look at it. And mm. kind of have to game each one individually and understand how they move. Alex, Chichamaro, welcome to the show. What's going on? Good to see you. Um, so you have the... the Distinguished honor, I don't know if you know this, um, of being my first guest of nearly 100 guests in the last two years on the new music business, uh, who works at a major label. Uh, as, oh, damn. Oh, damn is right. <laughs> Get ready, Alex. I don't know if you, if you knew what you signed up for, uh, but you're here now, and you're not allowed to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so um i'm with it i'm with it Let's do great it. great uh no but I'm, I'm really excited to chat with you uh you have a, a pretty incredible history and um a great perspective um on the industry from where you sit and i know that the audience is going to be really interested to hear your perspective as a as vp of marketing at rca and the, the history that you've done but before we get into all of that um We'll spend a lot of time talking about that. I just want to know kind of your journey a little bit uh, in the in the industry. How did you get to where you are right now? Yeah, um, I started well, like the earliest the earliest point when I really started getting into music was around like fifteen, sixteen. I'm thirty. I just turned thirty three on Monday. Ah, oh, happy um, birthday! All right. Thank you very much. But um, yeah, like around 15, 16 years old, uh, a friend of mine, this is when message boards and MySpace, that was like the, the that was the mix of digital marketing and music yep. at the time. Yep. And um, <clears throat> a friend of mine in high school, he made uh, like almost like a, a snippet track um, of this whole thing with like Cameron and Jay-Z and there's this whole back and forth mm -hmm. and it went viral and viral at the time was like a bunch of people, uh, posted it on MySpace and sure. bloggers picked it up. It got like some credibility, whatever. Mm -hmm. And he went, do you want to manage me? And I never really like knew what the music business was. I just kind of knew there was a music business. Yeah. Um, and so from that, hold on. Okay, I'm on the phone. You got to close the door, okay? Thank you very much. Sorry about that. I got two That's kids. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, um, you know, we. Uh, he goes, do you want to manage me? I didn't really know anything about the music business at the time. Um, and he got invited to one of these, like, DJ calls. They used to do these, like, huge conference calls where DJs would all hop on from across the country and they'd be able to meet artists, right? Hmm. So I hop on the call and I know absolutely nothing about what's going on. And I think Paul Wall at the time was on the call. He's probably promoting the song. And I'm just like yelling like, hey, I'm here for DJ <laughs> Phil Effect. I'm here right now. And I'm clearly muted. Nobody pays attention to me. <laughs> um, and that was kind of the start. And then at that point, I wanted to take it seriously. So I uh, went to Full Sail for college. Uh, okay. I was actually in the first ever music business program that they did. 
Um, I was there when they like launched the whole thing. Gotcha. Um, it was a good time while I was in Orlando. I'm originally from New York, but while I was in Orlando, mm -hmm. um, I was working, I did like college radio stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't like on air, but I interned for one of the DJs. Um, I interned for a street promoter. So I was like, my days would be like going to school and then um, meeting up. Her name was Jesse McGuire and like shooting interviews that she did and, and emailing them to blogs and stuff. And then I'd leave her at around like two, three o'clock in the morning and I'd go to the club and pass out flyers outside the club and you see like crazy shit. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> Shout out to Orange <laughs> Avenue in, uh -huh. in Orlando. I recently went out there. I recently went out there, and they 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 call it like they have like some name for it now. It was I don't know. They're trying to be like Soho. Anyway, so <laughs> I uh, I did all that, and then I left, and I, I ended up working for came back to New York, worked for a guy named Alan Strom, who. I would say is like the first guy that really put me on in the music business. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, he was a uh, mix show radio promoter, like an indie. Um, and he introduced me to a lot of different people. He had me, you know, kind of almost being like, because he was moving to North Carolina. So he had me being a conduit for him in a lot of things mm -hmm. where I helped um, produce content for Talk Out Tuesdays and Show Off Radio, which are two radio shows on Sirius Satellite Radio on Shave 45. Um, I was running a blog for him called alanstrom.com where we did like interviews about the music business, kind of like mm -hmm. this, right? Like I yeah, would go yeah. interview marquee people in the music business and we, we did a lot of shit there, which is actually a really great way that I got to meet people. Um, I was what was radio promotion all. like at that time? We're talking like what, 2010 or so? Yeah, like, yeah, 2010, 2009. To be honest with you, the radio side, I didn't really touch. Oh, okay. Like, gotcha. That was his thing. I mm -hmm. was doing more so digital. I was helping, looking back on it, we didn't even realize, but what I was doing was I was helping him build a brand that was kind of B2C, but I'm sure it had an impact on like a B2B level. Like, I'm sure, sure. more people wanted to work with him because they saw him, mm. but we never really like that wasn't what we were thinking at the time. What we were Got thinking it. was like, it, honestly, it was, there's all these music blogs that are in the world, like not right on smash and, and these like huge, huge publications in hip hop. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to do something like that. And I convinced him that everybody's doing music and everybody's going about it where it's like, let's go post a new song. And right. like follow the gossipy headlines in certain places on what's happening with these artists. Let's do the music business. Like let's show the other side of it. And we did like I think we did Chris Clancy's first interview when he started working with um, Odd Future and Tyler the Creator. That was a big one. Mm. I think I did Chris Lighty's last interview ever before he passed. I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, artist wise, we did like Nipsey Hussle, Kendrick Lamar, Macklemore when he was at the height of Macklemore sure. and like yeah. a lot of crazy stuff. And then yeah. we produced a lot of other content as well for Sirius. We did some stuff for Complex. We did some stuff for Vivo, uh, MySpace, a couple other platforms. Mm -hmm. Um, and then through all that, I started working at a website called Hot New Hip Hop as their artist relations person because it kind of like culminated everything and they had just launched a new york uh place and we we launched some content there and i did some exclusive artist partnerships blah 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 mm -hmm. and then through that i started working at labels around like 2014 i would say 2013 2014 um i was the digital marketing manager at atlantic and while i was at atlantic i worked on a bunch of stuff um i worked on hamilton the the sound the soundtrack oh, i worked wow. on yeah, I worked on uh, Cardi B. Literally the last thing I did at Atlantic was, one of the last things I did was launching um, Bodak Yellow, the single oh, wow. um, that really like put her on the map. I literally set the, I always tell the story. I set the the video live on YouTube from Junior's Cheesecake in Brooklyn. 
from my phone <laughs> and just watch my phone like blow up. It, it, it was a funny thing. Great it's like a funny little thing. But, um, Wait, so yeah, how did you, I'm there. curious, um, so you broke yeah. in, uh, how did you get that job as a digital uh, marketing director at Atlantic? Did you just apply or did you know someone? Was it through the connections from Hot New Hip Hop or? Yeah, so it was, I mean, it was a mix of things. So mm -hmm. one, I had a, a friend of mine um, who was already working there. Her name is Marlise. Mm -hmm. um, shout out to Marlise. And she uh she hit me she knew i was trying to leave high new hip-hop mm -hmm. and she's like oh there's a position that's opening up there's these two guys that um they they run a company now called 740 project raheem and punch are their names um they were the digital marketing managers at the time in atlantic mm. and they were on the way out to actually i think go do their like really go full force with 740 themselves sure they're having real success right now they have an artist by the name of glorilla she has a song called f and f that's going crazy on tiktok shout out to them but um uh -huh. they were leaving at the time and i knew them through hot new hip-hop but i knew marlise previous because in the midst of all of this i was mm -hmm. road managing in atlanta i know it seems like a lot but i was i was back and forth between new york and atlanta a lot and i knew marlise through there um you were on tour you like road managing for an art for an artist um, while on tour. yeah shit yeah it was a group called two nine um wow. based <laughs> out of atlanta i was i i literally i remember when i would go down to atlanta i would literally be homeless in atlanta for like months at a time um mm. and i remember at the time i didn't know if wi-fi would be good so i had to buy one of those like wireless router that you plug sure. into your laptop <laughs> oh yeah so i could make sure i could do all the stuff for al still it was mm -hmm. it was a crazy i didn't even know it was a lot that i was doing then but i was doing a lot i was doing way mm -hmm. too much. um and yeah i mean that was it i i think the reason why i got the job probably at atlantic was because i had a diverse enough resume Okay. where I understood digital marketing. I came from, at the time, a really prominent website. I knew mm -hmm. content creation. I knew social media. I knew, you know, all these things. And at the and time, I, I mean, blogs was, were kind of where, where it was at in music. I mean, uh, we're talking probably, I'm um, just to get the timeline right, uh, what, like 2014. 2012, 2014. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was the height of, of Hype Machine. I mean, that was essentially, if you started charting on... Um, hype machine you know the blog aggregator of the time uh and you got some you know you got pigeons and planes or consequence of sound or um anything like that um empire it would be something where that would translate into hundreds of thousands of streams on soundcloud uh it, that that was kind of what was the driving the conversation and if you started charting i mean every label and manager this was like this was, you know, the mid aughts. It was that everyone was was after you, and this was kind of how a lot of artists kind of got their their start. I would say around that time um, by getting all that blog coverage. Yeah, that was definitely it. Was it was? I would say this. It was it was a crazy moment because it was right when. Um, right before like streaming obviously spotify app like apple music didn't exist yet right um spotify was there i think mm -hmm. if you were in like almost like the indie music scene pop music edm you were very aware of spotify if you mm -hmm. were a fan of hip-hop you didn't give a shit like it was you were SoundCloud. downloading mix yeah or downloading mixtapes off that, like that piff that piff and hot new hip-hop where i worked right. and, and right. places like that so you weren't really tapped in with what was happening in the streaming scene at that point. Sure. Um, that makes sense. And so the blogs were really, it's funny, like I have a, a, a group of friends, Jeff and Eric, who are doing uh, something around like this whole thing. Like they, they, they're very like entrenched in, into that time. Mm -hmm. And like they're, you know, we've been talking back and forth about it and, and it just, it feels like that was such a small but important era of how marketing and digital marketing developed. There was like a blend between 
what's publicity, what's digital marketing. Nobody knew. It was kind of like who had the relationship. There was this like world of like, you know, almost like industry plants where at the time it was way, you know, if you had a, a high power publicist at a record label convincing, you know, X, Y, and Z blog that it made sense to, to pick your record up and they thought they were kind of dope, even if the public didn't really like it, they got like a really good push and a lot of looks would happen for them. And mm-hmm. you would just start, you started seeing a lot of um, that stuff almost fade away when I started working in digital marketing, right? Mm. Like it, it it was the end of it. And yeah. when I came in, it became this era of SoundCloud was like the ultimate thing mm-hmm. um, for new artists and new artist discovery, SoundCloud and YouTube. Yeah. This is when you start seeing really like the rise of um, like aggregates on SoundCloud that are like, reposting music and and Mm. sharing music to a large audience of people. Mm -hmm. Um, This is when you start seeing, you know, remixing really becoming like a much bigger thing in hip hop. Right. I mean, it always was, don't get me wrong. Like it it literally comes from hip hop, but it becomes a big thing again, where now like genres are getting crossed and EDM is really diving heavy into hip hop and and wanting to work with them. and, And you see a lot of that. Um, and yeah, it, and then the minute that Apple music really hit, I remember being at Atlantic and having like a big company wide, like this is going to happen. This mm-hmm. is going to change the way everything works. And that was 2015, 2016. Yeah. And like when that happened, it was, it was lights out. It was basically like the whole game shifted mm. and everybody was obsessed with streaming playlisting. Everyone yeah. was obsessed with social media management that was really what what digital marketing became like Mm -hmm. content creation and and you know social platforms sure so let's jump ahead a little bit um how long have you been uh with rca i've been at rca for three years but i've been at well two and a half really i've been at sony for five so um I started at Sony. I had a joint venture label, um, myself and my business partner, Jonathan Master, called Same mm-hmm. Plate Entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um, and from that, right before the pandemic um, in 2020, we are we had already had a JV deal. We were in the center of Sony, but we also had a JV deal directly with RCA. Explain and, what that um, means. What does a JV deal mean? So it means that you're essentially a company that works independently of a major label, um, Mm -hmm. but you're partnered with the major label and have access to their resources. So like the way to think about it is we sign artists, our staff works the artists. We don't necessarily follow the same protocol that the larger Sony entity does, but Mm -hmm. where we lapse in um ability to move like for instance dsp pitching or like you know radio things like that we're able to tap into the larger entity of of rca and say hey we have this record coming that's bubbling up are you willing to work with us on it blah 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 and then Mm -hmm. we put a plan together and what do they get um, in return of that? Like, what's the what's the JV partnership? They co own. Uh, they co own the, the the venture. It's a JV stands for joint venture. So they co own the label. Got it. Okay. And so they have a, a financial interest in the label succeeding, and so they're willing to invest some of their resources uh, to help out the records that you're working because if your revenue increases theoretically that's better for them even though they don't own the masters necessarily no they're part of it they are part of it they're definitely so yeah so if you're a joint venture label uh Uh let's say if you're a jv of rca right now like just rca sure you you have an agreed upon split between um your company and the label itself right so the label rca when i say label 
handles your distribution. So they get your music out into the world, right? Sure. The mechanics mm -hmm. of it. They then collect and then pay out everything. That mm -hmm. mechanism alone can sometimes be difficult and they run that. And then yeah. beyond that, um, what they're doing is offering label service at a higher level, right? They mm -hmm. offer a major label service to an artist. And a lot of times what you see is, because all labels have joint ventures. If you ever saw the um, the uh, Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre, I forgot what it's called, the documentary that they put out like five, six years ago. Oh, yeah. I think it's called The Defiant Ones. Right, There's, yep, yep. So he explained, like Jimmy Iovine really can break that down in that where he's explaining um, what De Death Row was a joint venture partner of Interscope, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he, the way Jimmy Iovine moved was very much like finding these partners to do these deals with. Because what happens is a lot of the times in the major label system, um, you have so many artists at one time, right? Sure. And you want every artist to be able to get the uh, attention that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times these joint ventures are helpful in that way because what it means is, is that you have somebody that you trust that can give the artist like that bespoke attention to mm -hmm. go do like the core things that are necessary for that artist. Sure. And then in return, when things are ready, you can elevate that support through the major. I actually work as now with a joint venture that's really successful, uh, Winter Circle Entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, artist Chef G, Sleepy Hollow. Sleepy was literally named um, Spotify's Rise Artist of last year. Like, right. And and those guys came in with a ton of momentum already built. They, they had a ton of, you know revenue coming in and just everything working in their favor sure. so it doesn't really make sense to say come sign with us and then we're going to take everything over instead right. it's a partnership and it's supposed to be set up where you know we help them in enhance their infrastructure and then in return when things are ready to go we're able to help layer in where they feel like they need the assistance i read uh somewhere in an interview um i believe uh it was with your your um someone for, about same plate entertainment they were mentioning how they structured their deals a little bit differently than most majors they wouldn't touch 360 deals uh necessarily yeah. and so with these joint ventures and sometimes these uh jv labels um so they're able to kind of structure the deals however they want without necessarily much interference in the contract and negotiation with their parents I can't speak on everybody because everybody's different. Sure. Um, it all depends. I don't know the ins and outs of, honestly, I don't know the ins and outs of any JV at that level other than the one that we had, but yep. the one that we had, yeah, we were, we were able to structure deals. John master, who was, was the president and, and mm -hmm. my business partner on it, he had come from empire distribution. So he came yep. from the school of artists, first deals, the school of short term, allowing the, like, our, our whole MO when we started Same Plate um, as a label, initially it was a marketing company and we had a, a third partner by the name of Benner Hall. Mm -hmm. um, but when we uh, came to Sony and, and became a, a label, um, the whole MO was we wanted to do artist-friendly deals that were focused on recouping fast. Sure, We wanted artists to be able to get in um and be able to make money whether it was a licensing deal a master deal whatever it was and, and all mm -hmm. deals were done differently but mm -hmm. essentially the the shtick was we were doing 50 50 deals straight partnerships um on profit um instead of a of a royalty deal which is a whole separate thing that i can't really get into but sure. it, it's a it's a way more artist friendly deal and you yes. never did 360s and we only did short-term deals. We only did, you know, very small, like two album commitment deals, like things that were really built around the idea of allow us to have an actual shot to help grow this thing. But then in return, like we want to make sure that you're making your money and yeah. you're not um, in a spot where you don't see money down the line. And, you know, 
hopefully, mm-hmm. obviously, like it's it's only been it's crazy to think because that feels like it was like a decade ago, but it's been you know two and a half years since we folded in RCA and kind of became one with them and and um, the joint venture is no longer really standing. It does in some ways, but mm-hmm. not what it used to. And like, you know, I'm seeing artists that we work with now um, from when we first started get that close to recouping, get that close to being able to, to where they're now going to be making money for the rest of their life on their music. And then, mm-hmm. you know, I, I that, that was the goal always. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's artists that we really believed in that, you know, it, it, it might not have worked out the way we wanted. And I'm seeing those guys um, on their own now take whatever leverage and help we were able to layer in um, and go crazy with it. I'm seeing them do really well for themselves. And mm-hmm. that's what we want to see, man. We just want to see yeah. artists win, you know? So, so, um, all right. So let's talk like the last uh, couple years or so. Um, now that you've you kind of folded, Winter Circle has folded into RCA. I mean, you're, you're well, same plate into RCA. Same plate. Okay. Yeah. Um, gotcha. And then, uh, and so you mentioned you worked Sleepy Hollows. Um, and that record, I mean, that one alone, uh, the 2055 20, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, 2055, that one, uh, it's got like almost a half a billion streams. It's on Spotify alone right now. It's got, you know, nearly a hundred million views on YouTube. Uh, Sleepy Hollow's got 12 million monthly listeners. I'm curious. Now, this is something that really struck me when just looking at the project, um, a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Now that uh, 2055 came out uh, last year, um, yep. and he doesn't sleepy. Ola, correct me if I'm wrong. I couldn't find a TikTok profile for him. Is that correct? He's on TikTok. He has one. Um, it's it's uh, the real sleepy Z Z Z Z Z. Um, but he doesn't well, use shit. it. No. I was search. Okay. He doesn't use it. I was going to say, he, cause I was searching he, and yeah, <laughs> he's definitely, he's been on there a couple times. He's not really like one. Honestly, he's not really one for social media period, but, sure. um, I mean, I think if you listen to the music and you really dive in, you'll get an understanding why he's a very introverted guy. Yes. Um, but yeah, he, uh, yeah. So, so talk to me about that. Um, more so, we can we can go kind of macro and micro here. Um, as a as a, a marketing director, as a VP of marketing, um, you know, I uh, the perception of major label marketers right now is uh, you know, and thanks to Halsey and thanks to the rest or whatever, is just like we always we always just say <laughs> go on TikTok. Right. It's just yeah, like that's 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 uh <laughs> that's the ten point plan of marketing this new release is is TikTok numbers one through ten is is the entire marketing plan. Now um yeah. debunk that myth for me, if you will, or in enforce that uh that that statement. Um tell me when you're structuring a marketing plan for a release, what does it look like? And uh specific I mean yeah. that's kind of on the macro side, but on the micro side, like I was struck that sleepy hollow really doesn't have much of a TikTok presence the song 2055 does that song has you know 370,000 yeah. uh video creations on just the song but maybe maybe talk about working that record but also maybe your your macro approach to marketing any any release um in with all the tools that you have at your disposal yeah um so all right it's a two-part thing so sure. i think the TikTok thing. So I think Sleepy is a really great example of you don't really need all platforms to win. You just need to do one really well. And Sleepy's platform is Spotify. Okay. Straight up. Okay. Um, I, I if you go through and. TikTok is actually a really great tool where you can get a really deep understanding of what fans care about on an artist just by searching hashtags. So if, if like anybody that's listening to it wants to understand what I'm saying, just search Sleepy Hollow or mm-hmm. or Sleepy Hollow Deep End Freestyle or, or any of the big records and you kind of mm-hmm. get through it. And so he 
what he talks about in his music strikes a chord with fans, right? It's it's very deep. It's about mental health. It's about um, being introverted and not trusting people. And, you know, it, it connects in a big way. And I think the same way that you would see five years ago, like, um, and, and maybe this comparison's off because sonically it's different, but like how XXXTentacion cut through on SoundCloud and people mm -hmm. were just going crazy. And he didn't really post a lot. He was very elusive. He didn't really want to like show too much, but people hung on every word because of the depth in his music. Or what you see with NBA Youngboy right now, right? On YouTube, where you can name the biggest artist in the world and NBA Youngboy will shit on that numbers wise on that platform mm -hmm. because he's developed an audience on that platform where people desperately care about what he has to say. It's the same thing with Sleepy and Spotify. When he drops music, people pay attention straight mm -hmm. up. If you look at, um, I mean, you know, one of the things that happened on, on Spotify for 2055 is we just had other music happen. Like he was consistent. So mm. when he came in to RCA, he had a record called Deep End Freestyle that was already gold by the time it had got to us. We don't have any rights in that record, but um, they had done that independently. But he had a moment already happening for himself. And so we had put a record out called Tiptoe with him and Chef G, who's the other person in, in Winter Circle. That was how we launched everything. And then, you know, a few months later, Chef put his album out and Sleepy was on that album. So everything, again, Spotify bumps up and, and you see, you know, monthly listeners rise, you see attention happening there. And then a few months later, he starts rolling his album out and we had actually put a single out called Two Sauce as the first record it's, it's on the same album and that got a ton of attention but then 2055 came out and it, it just stuck there right like it mm. was the right record at the right time for his fans he had all, all his attention on the platform um he is big on on other platforms as well like apple music but spotify is really like the hub for him numbers wise and you saw it just stick there and then, you know, fast forward, we put out another song called Chicken about a month later, and then it jumps up again mm -hmm. because everybody mm -hmm. that went to go hear Chicken went to go back to listen to 2055. And then we put the album out a week later, and then it goes through the roof, and, you know, he gets added to playlists on Spotify, playlists on right. Apple. He gets all the support across the partners because the numbers were just there. And that's kind of how things start happening. And then as a label, what we're doing is we're watching that and we're chasing it. And, and I think what you mentioned on the TikTok side was a lot of us, um, you know, working with TikTok as a partner, showing them the numbers, showing them how things were, were coming together. A lot of it was his fans on TikTok and figuring out what they were organically doing and then finding ways to amplify that. Um, and when you on say platform, ampl I'm assuming when you say amplify that on the platform, are you working with influencer marketing agencies uh, to work uh, to essentially hire influencers to use the song in their videos? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll always do some level of influencer marketing. Um, but a lot of, some, sometimes it's just straight up advertising, right? It's, it's okay. working with fans that create content, working, especially when an artist is, has that deep of a relationship, like sleepy working with them to amplify their content using advertising, right? There's, there's ways you can do that. Um, and what also taking that con sorry, go uh, ahead, go ahead. There's ways that you can take that content. Um, that fans are creating and help tell a narrative off platform, right? Whether it's on YouTube, where there's all these aggregate accounts and, and you can pitch them on, hey, here's all the all these people posting about this record. You should highlight this song. Or, mm. you know, beyond that, like you can you take that and you can tell a story with publicity. I think Sleepy, we just did a really great piece with Sleepy. Uh, it just came out last week with Complex. 
that kind of dives into like how music, how he views how music is consumed um, on platforms like TikTok and how he views how he makes music period. And a lot of it has to do with looking at how fans are reacting and telling the story about, oh, your fans clearly have a, a very deep connection with the lyrics. Because a lot of the stuff that gets posted on TikTok are people highlighting lyrics and mm. making things about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think a lot of it on TikTok, it's a mixed bag depending on the artist, right? Yeah. Like Sleepy is, a, like I said, a great example of an artist who has a really great platform with Spotify. But if you're like a brand new artist, um, you know, I've, I'm seeing artists go uh, like have their breakthrough moment simply by them being the ones that are putting content out themselves, right? Sure. We have an artist sure. on the label by the name of Young Manny, who I don't work on, but I think is a great example of it, who's had huge moments on TikTok, and he's able to get attention for himself simply because he understands the platform, and mm -hmm. he knows how to create content. I think when you hear the, like, well, one, sometimes I think when you hear the, like, big artists, I've never had a big artist this on me because we don't none of my marketing plans ever stay only do tiktok like that'll never happen but like i think sometimes when you hear a big artist go oh you know they told me i have to go viral on tiktok to do this it's literally them just saying that to go viral on tiktok yeah like they already know what they're gonna do um but sometimes i i do think there is a real need for people to understand how new fans consume music and we're getting to a place where playlisting what which was like the end all be all of things and, mm -hmm. and it's still a huge part of it playlisting is not really like the biggest thing the biggest thing right now if you want to be discovered is short form video content and being able on any platform to have your music algorithmically served up as much mm -hmm. as possible. Those are the two most important factors in terms of developing an audience, especially on the digital side. Mm. Um, obviously there's platforms are different even off, like radio is way different than what Spotify is versus what Apple is versus what, you know, a touring act might do. They're all, these are all different, you know, they're not just platforms technically but they're really all different platforms in, in the way that i look at it and mm -hmm. you kind of have to gain each one individually and understand how they move and then the other side of it is is you have to understand your artist mm. not every artist is going to want to go be social and get on tiktok mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. and that if the artist is talented enough to carry that is acceptable like i used to say when i was in digital marketing at Atlantic there, I used to call it the, the like Wiz Khalifa weekend spectrum where mm -hmm. like one side of it is the weekend who at that point literally never did anything. I don't think ever did an interview. This is like 2014 again. Like he literally refused to do anything, but put music out in big videos and like have big looks. And that was it. And he was huge. And then Wiz Khalifa was touring everywhere, doing all the interviews, being the friendliest guy in the world, on YouTube, doing day in the life vlogs, like showcasing every bit of his lifestyle. And he was huge, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them attacked it in different ways and both of them could carry it. And I think the difference is, is that the more you get onto the weekend side, the more you're dependent on, um, how good is my music and how how much will it carry with the fans that are paying attention to me versus mm -hmm. if you're on the whiz side the music still has to be great but you're also giving fans more of a lifestyle you have more of an opportunity to stay in people's space and you know i, I think you have to understand what artists you're dealing with and where they fit on that spectrum yep. and then you can plan from there that's great. And, and, um, the, it's kind of, I, I discussed this concept of like the, um, on the weekend side is kind of like, I call it the I artist. It's just like the ones that, that have their entire aesthetic, their brand, their story. It's all kind of 
polished, worked out, and it's through this lens. And then on the other end of the spectrum, it's almost like these these constant creators, but also like the ones that are everywhere and anywhere. And everyone falls somewhere on the spectrum. I mean, on the weekend side, on that IR side, it's kind of like um, you're essentially dependent on a lot of the gatekeepers because if they release a mu- a song and sure. nothing happens in the weekends and the artists are just sitting back and be like, well, do something. And it's just like, well, nothing's happening. Whereas like Wiz will go or someone else will make it happen. And that's like essentially, you know, the power that artists can have these days is just like they can throw 50 TikTok videos up and one of them catches versus if you're, but that being said, most artists that I know would honestly appreciate to be on that weekend side to just make the music put in and, and the videos oh. and sit back and relax. <laughs> Every artist wants to do that. Right. Every I don't know a single artist that wouldn't love the idea of I'm going to put music out and the whole world is going to think it's great. Instantly. <laughs> of course. Right? Yeah. Like, like I would love that. I would love for every mm-hmm. one of my artists to have that opportunity. I think the reality of it is, is that we, um, it's very different than, you know, and I wasn't obviously in the music business at the time, but like, it's very different than it was in like the nineties or the two thousands where every artist essentially had time to develop quietly. Yes. Right. You could develop every aspect of your brand and your live show and your music and everything could kind of cook quietly on its own. And then you could pop up out of nowhere and start rolling things out. And, and, you know, if everything was good, it would be a cut above everybody else. Now everything's on 24 seven. So you really don't have that opportunity to, to kind of go away, which makes it even more difficult when you're the weekend or, or you want to be like the weekend. Right. Because, you know, the weekend is incredible, right? Like house of balloons is probably one of the best albums of the last 20 years, in my opinion, at least. Right. Like it's, he came out with arguably one of the biggest, biggest albums of a generation of people. Yeah. How many artists do that? How many right. artists put out, how many artists in their entire discography have an album like that? Mm-hmm. Really not many. So like, you know, you have to bank on a lot to get that. The one thing I'd say on the Wiz side, though, and I hate to keep using him as an example, but like sure. the one thing I'd say on that is that the ones that work on there also have their shit polished, right? They also have their brand together. Like mm-hmm. the reason why Wiz works is because Wiz is a lifestyle. Taylor Gang was a lifestyle at that time, right? Yeah. You could, you were smoking weed. It was having sex yeah, sure. with, with your enemy's girlfriend. It was <laughs> going to shows with camo pants on and, yeah. and, a, and a snapback, right? And Jordans. Like you knew what that was. They just showed you that lifestyle a lot. And the ones that don't work, yeah. On that side, mm. especially now where everything's on, they don't understand the lifestyle that they have to. They're the leaders of every artist really needs to be the leader of a community, a leader of a lifestyle. Right. Mm. To be super successful. Mm. And even even not even if you wanted to be like like Killer Mike's a great example of an artist yep. right now that that he had, or or Bum B, another great example. He had, he was on the Earn Your Leisure podcast and, and he I think it was that one. And he mentioned like, you know, the minute I learned that, you know, you don't need a million fans to be a millionaire, everything changed, right? But the reality is is that Bun B as a brand and a lifestyle, UGK and what he represented there, and then how he transitioned that into you know being more of like this og figure and under and living that kind of like like stamp on houston culture guy brand Mm -hmm. he even though that audience and that that quote-unquote niche is not tremendous according to him it's still something where he's the leader of it and he can guide Mm -hmm. people and you know when you think of bun b you can name the three to five tent poles of what he represents. Sure. And what I often see with new artists is 
they want to do that side of things, right? They want to do, they're really good at getting on TikTok and making YouTube videos and being consistent. But the thing that they always fall into the trap of is that they're doing it in the way that like an influencer or creator does it, where they don't really stand for anything. They don't really represent anyone. Instead, everything is how do I get engagement? Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. the minute you're in that mode is the minute that you're it's the reason why you've seen a million you know influencers try to do music and it never really works i can i can name a handful where it connects and the reason why is because those people are not artists by trade or or i'm sorry artists in like their pure heart of hearts music is a content play for them just like everything else Yes. And like the fan will always be able to decipher the two. That's great. And uh, that's it's so well put. Um, it's art. I mean, artists are leaders and that's why fans follow artists. That's why fans fall in love with artists. It's not because of one song that they dig. It's because artists are le- leading a movement and and establishing community and are leaders of that community. You said it really well. Um, now. Yeah. I'm curious though, in this in this age that we're in though, uh, where you know it almost requires you to be always on, as as you kind of say it. Um, what do you say to these artists, maybe like Sleepy and, and others, uh, who are resistant to being always on, who don't feel comfortable shining that portal into their entire existence at all times, whether it be on TikTok or any other platform, uh, when there's resistance there, how do you approach a release or uh, a rollout with an artist uh, that doesn't have that much interest in uh, those those platforms that, that we have right now? You do things around them. You don't do it with them, right? Like, you... And I'm I'm literally like just kind of like going on the top of my head, but like sure. you find where those you find the fan pages and you develop a relationship with the artist fan pages and you give them exclusive content first, right? You, mm. um, excuse me, you um, if you wanted to put out. I don't know, like a, a like a music video, you figure out how to uh, create a bunch of like little pieces and Easter eggs that you can give to these different blog accounts to hype things up. You give them re- you give fan to put it in, in cause these specifics is what throwing me off. But basically what I would say is the overarching objective is you just want to create demand. The easiest mm-hmm. way to create demand is through the artist speaking to the people themselves Sure. But the reality is, is that nine times out of 10 artists aren't going to be the ones that can do that um, because they they can't be the only voice in the room. And so mm-hmm. you have to identify the other people that can be loud for you, the platforms that can be loud for you and work with them to create that sort of amplification for you. So if an artist doesn't want to do all the talking, cool, let's figure out what the artist wants to do. Let's get those pieces together that help tell the story in an interesting way. And then Mm -hmm. let's put that out there into the world using partners, using, you know, if I'm an indie manager right now, which I think most of them are at this point, Mm -hmm. the name of my game is I'm just going on TikTok and I'm hitting every single influencer, every single like music aggregate page on TikTok. And I'm trying to find ways or doing deals or whatever it takes to just get awareness on my artists, whether they're going to be loud or not. Right. Um, Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the MO of it. I think you just have to work around them to help build that. A good example of it, by the way, is not a music thing, Mm -hmm. but like, if, you, are, if you're paying attention to TikTok right now, you're very aware of what's happening with this Minions movie. Mm-hmm. Like the Minions movie has commercials and all this stuff. Don't get me wrong, but like nowhere has the Minions movie told you to dress up in a suit to go to the movies or get right. your friends. Yeah, that's influencer marketing and being really savvy about seeing what the trends are 
and not necessarily trying to force a conversation because I guarantee if like the people behind the Minions movie, whatever film company that is, they they decided, hey, we're gonna make this trend where everybody's gonna wear suits. Nobody would give a shit, but they right. saw it probably and uh-huh. they went for it. And I think that's the name of the game. And you can do that at the smallest levels, yeah. right? You don't have to be a huge artist with huge demand. A lot of it, like a lot, most great leaders in this world, they come from a place where they have no following, all of them really. Right. And what they do is they find the communities where they think they matter and then they voice their opinion in those communities. Mm. And like, that's really just the name of the game. It's you have to find where you would actually make a difference mm. and then be there. Yes. That's you great. Uh, you'd mentioned earlier um, advertising, PR, some of these more traditional methods that can work with, you know, as you put it, working around the artist. I'm curious uh, when discussing advertising a little bit more specifically these days, um, mm-hmm. where are you spending your ad dollars? Is it Instagram stories? Is it TikTok? Is it YouTube? What, what is like, if we were to look at, a, is it influencer marketing? If we were to look at a pie chart uh, and you had a kind of a marketing budget, where what's that percentage breakdown specifically i mean it's all again it's all going to be different for okay. every artist because every artist has a, has different places that they work well i think to to give actual like specifics to it i think the the key is to find out where the artist already works well and spend there right okay. so like example i have artists that aren't necessarily the biggest in terms of streaming but can go put thousands of people in a venue um in uh, any venue across the globe right what i do is instead of spending my marketing dollars on let's go get something big on tiktok Mm -hmm. like you said everybody likes to say right what i do is let's go make moments of them performing right Mm. like let's get them let's spend money to get them there three days early let's make sure they're touching all the right people in the marketplace Mm. let's make sure they're doing interviews let's make sure we utilize influencer marketing to do collaborative content so that way they're together with these people and they get some reach there let's use influencer marketing to get those folks plus other partners to the show so they can see you know, I, I had a really great moment that really broke things open for an artist. And this wasn't like a paid thing, but artist by the name of Skilly Bang that I'm working with, dance hall artist. Um, he has a record called Wap Wap. And the moment that really broke it open was he was in London for the first time and he performed to a sold out crowd of 4,500 people. And they went crazy. The, the <laughs> clip went was nuts it was it Mm. was was like goosebumps to see i'm like i'm getting it right now talking about it and like all we did was share that around to blog account like that's where we spent our money we advertised Mm. that clip that organic moment that you can't buy you can't put 4500 people in a in a room and tell them go crazy um and get that effect and we took that and we went with it and Mm. it went nuts and it became this sort of tentpole moment of what then became a series of those moments for him where he had that same moment in Miami, same moment in New York, same moment in Connecticut, same moment. He just did wireless five different times um, this past weekend. Different Two artists bringing him out. He has a song with Nicki Minaj. Nicki performs it. It goes so, crazy. Like, yeah. I mean, that that's great. And, and I love that. Now, that doesn't seem like the typical major label marketing move in that like how i guess where do where are the lines drawn in terms of who's responsible for what that that almost sounds like a move that the manager would be making uh or someone else on you know the digital person someone on the social team of that artist like i'm i'm surprised to hear that you know was that like something that happened it's a with group an artist effort. Okay, so talk to me about like effort. the relationship between the label and the manager and the artist and all of that because I haven't. Yeah, that's that's an interesting. I, so this take. is what I'd say, right? I think, I think every relationship is different, and I've been on the independent side 
um, Mm -hmm. of a lot of like good and bad. I've been on this side of a lot of good and bad relationships, right? I've seen kind of the full spectrum of things. The best relationships between like an artist team and a label are really founded in the idea that you're in it together. Mm. Right. And so honestly, that can be a difficult thing for a lot of people to, to come to grips with because I think, and I try and, and sometimes I do well with this. And sometimes to be honest, I don't do well with it, but I try to like lift the veil for anybody I'm working with. Like I, I, I really like my goal is to make sure that the artist and the manager have direct relationships across the company that if they have a question, they don't have to call me as a middle person. Cause sometimes the way it works is that when you're the uh, marketing person, you're what's called the product manager and you're essentially the ancillary point person to the A&R, right? Mm. So like the A&R is focused on music, you're focused on making sure the marketing is bad. And sure. so if the artist can't get the A&R on the phone, they call the marketing person. They say, well, what's going on with this, 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 right? And so what I found in the way I like to work is I want the artist and the manager to get the ins and outs from everybody. And I want everybody on the team to just be open and honest, right? Like mm-hmm. if things are going well, let's, let's own that together. If things are not going well and you know, a mistakes are made or, or, or mistakes aren't made and it just didn't work. Right. Like we're going to own that relationship together. That's the way I try to work things. Sure. I can't speak on other people and, and how they manage their artists and, and the flow of that. But sure. to me, that's the core of it. I think what you see a lot in terms of how people perceive the major label, like artist relationship. Mm-hmm. You don't really ever see a the man the label ever say anything, right? So you don't like you always see you you'll always see the artist go to social media because they feel like that's a place where they can vent their frustration in the moment, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the label can't do that, right? So you don't so no so I think what what tends to happen in the way people view the major label conversation, like what you just said, the comment you just said is like, you wouldn't see this a lot. I'll tell you right now, when I worked in digital marketing, every product manager I worked for worked the exact same way I did. I learned mm-hmm. like half the game I learned was from a woman by the name of Marsha St. Hubert, who's the head of marketing now at Atlantic. And I would literally sit with her for two and a half years on just the projects that we worked on. And I would see how she kind of operated um, and she's Cardi B's product manager. She's Kodak Black's product manager. She's um, obviously, I just said she runs the entire marketing thing. And yeah. basically, like, that's how she moved. Like, so, she was very much, you know, it was very much in the mix of artist friendly, wanting to do what's best for the project. And yeah. honestly, I can name 10 others that I worked with. And I can name well, every, I'll say right now, everybody that I work with here at RCA, every other product manager is the same book. That's, I mean, that's great to hear. Now, give some advice to managers who are listening to this right now who are struggling with their labels or their product manager and don't feel like their label uh, is maybe giving their artist the attention that they're hoping for, the marketing attention. Uh, maybe the product manager isn't really um, giving them uh, the this this attention or this thought behind like that you say that everyone you know does devote because on the flip side i mean you're working day in and down on a label you're biased i'm talking to artist managers every day who are like i can't you know they're not talking to me i can't get them on the phone they're like i don't think they're really caring about this record anymore man like i'm stuck here i'm not sure what to do i don't know who to call my I'm, i feel i'm blocked out from the product you know so talk to those yeah. managers what how do you work that I just think it's communication. Okay. Right? Like I look, again, I can't speak to every product manager in or a marketing person or A and R person in the world and how they handle things. I can only really speak to myself and what I've seen. But it's communication, right? Mm-hmm. It's not being afraid to have the hard conversation. It's not being afraid to 
sit there and say, um, you know, I fucked up, right? Because there is a world where, um, honestly, there is a world where like labels can be spotty with communication from time to time, right? Like I've been in that spot where, you know, just this week I have seven releases, right? So Whoa. there's a world where an artist couldn't get me until like six o'clock instead of the time when they called me at 11 a.m. I mean, yep. the one thing I'd say is I always, and this is just how I operate, I always make sure I have a weekly call standing with every single artist. I think if you don't have that and you're an artist manager, you should demand that, right? Mm. Like no matter what, there should be a physical touch point that at once a week, every single time, and you should be doing that. If you're an artist, you should be doing that with, as, as if you can, with your publisher, if you have a publisher, you should be doing that with your manager for sure. Even if you talk to your manager every day, right? There right. should just be a guaranteed on the schedule day and time when for an hour where you're going to sit there and you're going to go through all of the issues, good and bad. You're just going to talk about what's coming up. A lot of the times those calls become mundane and become like they drawn out because it's basically like, here's the update that we already know. What are we doing? We already know this, but like, it's better to have that than not. Um, the other thing, but, but again, like beyond just that, um, you also want to make sure that there's some sort of reporting mechanism, like our team, and this happened just in, in by means of us being a joint venture, but our team, one of the first people that we hired, his name's, uh, Gerard goes by G he, um, he's our data analysis guy, right? So just for our roster, which is now the roster that we oversee at RCA, which is just a part of the overall RCA roster. He sends weekly reporting on everything. So, mm. you know, top line stats, nothing crazy, but every week, you know how socials are going. You know how our priorities are, are developing in terms of stream volume. You know how videos perform. When content comes out, like major pieces, we, we always generally do um, – uh, a recap of either like the first 24 hours or first 36, depending on, you know, I mean, sorry, for 72, depending on if it's like a Friday, like, like we're always feeding information. And then if you mm. want more information, like I said, I shouldn't be the bottleneck of information. You have access to everybody. So mm. you should be able to call anybody on the team at any point in time and be like, Hey, you know, so-and-so in digital marketing, why didn't these influencers hit? Or why didn't yeah. these ads go up? Why didn't my video get approved for, you know, true view advertising on YouTube? Like, yeah, it, it's just about, you got to open the lines of communication and then you got to take those lines of communication seriously because, you know, if it's if it's at a the other thing I say is if it's at a point where you feel like you can't get anybody at the label on the phone and you've tried and you you know like you've gone through it and you've had these conversations at that point then it's just a relationship that's not working yeah flat yeah. out yeah you know and mm -hmm. and I wouldn't want that if I'm if I'm an artist manager I wouldn't want to be like blowing everybody like artist teams are gen at this point, you know, artist teams are 10 people deep mm. at, at a label alone. Right. And that's just mm. the core group, not mm. to mention like all the other people involved. So if you can't get one of 10 people on the phone to figure out what's happening, then there's a larger problem here. Sure. And I think at that point you got to like raise the red flag. Like, okay, this isn't yeah. for me. No, it's great. It's great advice. Um, I think that, you know, the weekly call uh, is a great idea. And, and hopefully, you know, everyone hearing that is it's giving them the confidence to request that if they don't already have one on the books. That's great. Well, I don't want to take any more of your time. You got all these releases coming out this week. I appreciate you carving no, out uh, Thank you. <laughs> this time. I do have one final question that I ask everyone who comes on the show. And that is, uh, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? To make it in the new music business? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, 
I would have said a lot of different things over the past, like my whole career. Sure. Um, I feel like right now to make it in the new music business is essentially, can you live the life that you want to live doing music by itself? Like I just plainly put, I, I, I think if you can do that, however that looks right. If you mm -hmm. want to like fly private jets and do all the crazy shit that you see in music video and music videos, and whatever you want to, then yeah, like that's a lot of work that you got to put in to get there. But again, like Bun B said, if you want to, if you, if you just, it doesn't take a million fans to make a million dollars. And so I think for me personally, I'm, I'm in a, I feel like I'm in a really great position in my career now where, you know, I'm working, I have the honor of working with people that I look up to, um, that have done tremendous things in the business. I have the, the ability where I'm making enough money. I have two kids and a wife, like I'm, I'm able to contribute to the household in a meaningful way. Um, and I'm able to like be happy. Like my, my mm -hmm. complaints are always that I'm trying to do something and it's not happening the way I want, or I'm trying to like execute on something and I'm not seeing eye to eye with someone. Like those are my complaints. My, com I, like my wife used to and still is, she's actually in her master's program, but my wife is in social work mm -hmm. and she worked with the homeless population. And I always tell this like story to friends of mine that I would come home and complain like, man, this, this artist thing isn't working. And like, oh, like they, they won't just approve my, my plan. They won't approve my budget, whatever. Da, da, da. She's like, yeah, I just had to Narcan a homeless guy because he was OD on the street today. And that's legit a true story. Put shit in perspective. Yeah. And so that's my point. If your complaints in, in this are like, like about this, about just doing this at a high level, then you've made it. In the music business, mm. sure. Alex, thank you so much. This is great. Really thank awesome. you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Today's episode was edited by Maxton Hunter, theme music by Brassroots District, and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.